uh, speed or racket face? Swing speed or racket face. Do you want to take that? Yeah, sure. Crush it. It Ian's says on, on it. here. YouTube Tag. stream is down. What's that? Oh, never mind. Oh, we're back. Okay. Alright, uh, sorry everybody. Uh, part two. For some reason, you zoomed on the screen. Um, so we're just going to pick up right where we left off. In our video um, manager. Drop shot question from? Uh, Ryan. Ryan. I don't know. I think this is it. What the technical difference was between a backhand slice and a backhand uh, go to drop shot. Um, and it's a, su it's a um, subtle difference, but a really to, uh, important one. And Ryan, basically here. what it comes down to is how steep the angle of your attack is. Kevin, a second ago, was just okay, talking about how um, um, uh, it starts back and slices higher up. It comes down more steeply. It'll create more rotation. And if all that travels a little bit uh, flatter and straighter, a little bit uh, more aggressive events, yeah. spin. Um, or you can also set up for and a backhand then... slice. Uh, more wonder if how we, yeah, yeah just try clicking on it. through laterally. And create a little bit more of a driving I wonder shot if you can share the, the video link. On a drop shot, your the main technique. Yeah, can you go to share? Is, is, there, is there a share option down, down here somewhere? And then coming back out and up again. And so, I was just going to try to share that link, but I mean. Like oh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead and share that in the Starting chat for the, contact, the previous slide. Okay. Down to contact, and then coming back up again to about shoulder height. So there's a huge, smooth U shape to a good. Backhand slice, whether it's defensive or more offensive, uh, the racket's coming down and then usually coming back up again. On a drop shot, uh, racket's usually starting up a little higher, coming down a little steeper, and typically the racket stays down. It's not coming back up and back out again to give the ball depth. The racket's just coming down and staying down. So on most drop shot attempts, to see the player come down to contact and the racket stays down below contact, as opposed to coming back up and out again. That's the main difference. It's all about the direction of attack, whether it's a U shape or. Ian, your mic's off. Oh, that's why. He said, I just got a lost audio. Thanks. Uh, so, what's that? It's all about uh, direction of swing, how steeply you're coming down, and whether or not you're coming back up and out again. Thanks. Hopefully, you still heard uh, some of that. Uh, okay, so um, on YouTube, are we live on YouTube again? We are live on YouTube. Uh, That's better from Ying. Yeah, yeah be. Ryan heard you. He said, right, cool. even though it was off, that explanation makes a lot of sense, he said. Good. Uh, so we're good. Before the first stream cut out, I saw a good question from, I believe it was Gibby, asked, can you hit an overhead from anywhere on the court? And the short answer is yes, uh, but here's the, the main factors. Uh, and, and Kevin, could you maybe hit, hit some feeds for me? Here we go. <laughs> uh, so Gibby, there's, there's two factors that you've got to be aware of. Factor number one is, can my racket see the other side of the court? Meaning, from where I'd be making contact, do I have direct access to the part of the other side of the court that I want to hit? So from inside the service line, if I'm making contact with a comfortable overhead, fully extended, uh, from here, if the camera was directly behind my racket, you could see pretty much the entire other side of the court. So from here, obviously, I can hit an overhead. The most important factor to keep in mind is direction of swing and matching it to what you can see on the other side. So from here, I can make contact with a closed racket face and, and successfully uh, make the shot and just hit directly to the other side of the court. Now, if my opponent hits a great lob, whether I take it out of the air or it bounces, and I'm making contact in the middle of no man's land, for me, it's six foot uh, tall. If I look, I can't see any of the other side of the court anymore. Now my racket probably can see part of it. I, I know it can see part of it, but it's probably only about half of no man's land. So from back in this position, the available court is totally different to me. So I can no longer close my racket face like I did inside the service line. So from back here, if Kevin hits me a higher, a deeper lob that bounces like a little bit past the service line, um, I can hit directly at the other side of the court, but I've got just a little bit of courts to work with. And so usually I'm actually gonna give myself a bit of margin by swinging upwards a little bit more. Oh boy. <laughs> so Kevin uh, skipped ahead to the next one. 
Uh, that one pushed me way back behind the baseline. I can still make an overhead, but now it's feeling like a serve because I can't see the other side of the court with my extended racket anymore, which means I need some shape. So I extended upwards much more. The direction of my swing was more vertical. That's what gave me safety to actually make an overhead swing and make the shot. So it all depends on your depth and what type of shot you're trying to hit. It should match the reality of where you are on the court. From back here, it's feeling like a serve, very vertical swing. From inside the service line, uh, very different, uh, downward to the other side of the court. And halfway in between will be halfway in between those, those variables. So the answer is yes. Those are the important things to keep in mind. Um, I was thinking one step ahead, Kevin. Real quick, uh, <laughs> before you come back, yeah. a, a little bit about the slice. Um, uh -huh. We have Tesher is asking about why you would use the U shape over a more straightforward. Okay. Um, Tesher? Yes, Tusher. Tusher? Mm -hmm. uh, Tusher, there's a million different shades of gray in the backspin repertoire, meaning um, you can hit a very drivey slice with a little bit of backspin. You can hit a really biting slice with very little drive and tons of backspin. Uh, Federer a lot of times will use that uh, to purposefully sit the ball up short and draw an opponent forwards. And then you've got everything in between. So you could start right basically right behind contact and go predominantly lateral out through the point of contact. Just understand it's gonna get you a very different flavor of slice than one where you start higher. One where you start higher will have more backspin. And so it depends on the point situation and what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, if you're trying to hit a shot that has more drive, more depth, um, then by all means, start lower. So there's, there's no wrong slice, maybe just a wrong situation to choose a particular variation of slice. Uh, but I highly uh, encourage all of you, especially those of you watching at home who uh, your bread and butter is kind of variety or touch or um, defense, um, practice, going through different uh, varieties. So this would be a more uh, driving uh, slice with just a little bit of backspin. And this would be uh, more spin. If I open my face up, I'll make it coming down and through. And so it's got a little more float to it where the driving one was more lateral and straight and flat. Uh, and so practice different starting heights, different attacking angles, uh, and creating different results on purpose so that when you get into a match, you can fit your shot to the point situation or the uh, opponent that you're playing against. Got got a YouTube couple question? questions. I got. You want to take it? Or? I don't know what is. I'll, it? I'll jam on <laughs> Q. We give some love out. I'm not so going to say George, yes, so I know what the question is. Oh no. So George had a question on the forehand. How far away uh, from the ball should he be on the s sideways to make contact? He gets jammed a lot. Mm. You want that? How far away? Uh, well, exactly how far away, George, depends on uh, the style of forehand you hit, which closely connected to that is what grip you use, but not necessarily. For example, um, Djokovic uh, has a semi-Western forehand. Go ahead and debate, debate me in the comments if you want. <laughs> and uh, at contact, he's got just about on every shot, he's got a little bit of a bend. Um, at contact. I'll show you guys uh, right-handed to uh, avoid confusion. And so he's not extended at contact. Um, Federer, who's at Eastern forehand, uses a very different stylistic uh, approach. He's extreme, yeah, he's on the far, far end of the spectrum of being extended uh, and straight out through contact. Um, then you've got Nadal, who's got like a strong semi-Western grip and is straight, pretty straight at contact and extended. So uh, grip has something to do with it. Generally speaking, the higher towards the uh, top of the grip you are, the more um, natural it is to extend your arm. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you, can, you can't have a little bit of a bend. Where amateur players get into trouble, regardless of grip, is when they start bending their arm to the point that their elbow is up against their side. Everything gets jammed up and the kinetic chain just can't flow the way that it's meant to flow because there's no room to allow the arm and the racket to work smoothly and uh, fluidly. So, um, is it George? Yeah. So George, um, something I like to do, uh, you want to demonstrate, Kevin? Sure. Something I like to do with my students 
And you can do this at home by yourself. Um, can you stand uh, just right on the quick start line here? Is I'll ask my students to, uh, to set up for a forehand. Uh, just Kevin, doesn't matter what stance, whatever you want, uh, just set up for a forehand. Uh, and I'm going to toss Kevin a, a couple of different balls here. And Kevin's objective is to stay put and make his swing. Kevin, go ahead, just take two, three shadow swings, get comfortable. You'll kind of see Kevin's natural kind of movement patterns here. And so Kevin, at contact, where would you say for you ideally, where, where is your elbow in relationship to your body? So Kevin's got a bit of a, a bend, kind of like Djokovic, uh, not up against his body, but far enough away that he can smoothly swing through. He's also not fully extended. He's, he's kind of part way in between. So on this uh, ball I'm about to toss Kevin, I'm going to toss him a couple. My uh, goal is to be to stretch him out past what he's comfortable with. So uh, let's say Kevin has a habit of being super jammed. Show us a couple of those swings, please, Kevin. Super jammed? Yeah. Oh, and here, I'm going to toss you a couple balls here. Uh, so your target's just any anywhere on the other side, doesn't matter where. And so I'm tossing Kevin uh, balls that don't give him enough room to extend uh, comfortably. So am I supposed to swing normal or add some super jam? Um, just keep your feet where they are okay. and just adapt to whatever I give you. Okay. So as I put my tosses closer, you'll see how his posture starts to shift, his hips start to slide out of the way to give him a little bit more room, but his elbow has no choice but to still be jammed up. And this is how many of you at home are swinging at your, your forehand ground stroke. Already <laughs> fell. <laughs> is uh, way too close, you're not measuring the ball correctly, you're not reading the ball correctly, and you're chronically jammed to the point where it, it just feels normal to you. And so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break that pattern for Kevin He's not allowed to move his feet. All he can do is just adapt with his body. And my goal is gonna to be to find the distance away from him where he has to actually start to, has to start to lean a little bit uh, on the other end of the spectrum. So, so saw a bit of a lean there. You saw his arm had no choice but to have to extend. And I'm gonna give him a couple out there. And so now from that back camera angle, you'll see how there's, oh boy. Nice, nice. So that's the first one where he had no choice. He had to fully extend on that one. So obviously not the, the swing that we want him to take, especially uh, with the way that his posture and his balance was. And now I'm going to try to find kind of the happy medium in between. So he's experienced very jammed. He's experienced fully extended because he had no choice. And now I'm just going to try to find uh, the sweet spot for Kevin. It's probably a little bit close. Nice. Tell me when you think you're, you're, it's like an ideal uh, distance, Kevin. It's a little, maybe a little close there. A little close. close. Right. It's a little far away. Okay. And so for those of you uh, watching, I, I probably just moved my toss by about four or five inches, and we went from a little close to a little far away. And so this, this is the task that you have with a ball traveling from 80 feet away to try to read it, measure it, put your feet in the right spot so that your body is in a comfortable place to unwind and use the kinetic chain correctly. It's a very, very precise thing. And when players get into a rut of being too close, uh, they end up kind of cementing that habit into their brain and it ends up being no bueno. How'd that feel? It's not all right. Close. Uh, it's still a little far away. A little from far? Me. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's the money ball right there. All right, cool. So you can do this at home. Um, and you don't, you don't even need somebody tossing to you. Uh, put yourself on the baseline. Find kind of your home base. Toss balls to yourself. Keep your feet where they are. Keep your stance and experiment with different, di different distances away from your body until you find a distance that feels really comfortable to you. I strongly recommend using your phone or an iPad, record it and look at it and see visually if it looks like it's a natural looking uh, swing. I'm gonna give some love to, to a former student. Some Logan De Los Santos had a question on- Hi Logan. On uh, if you get pulled out wide, when should you hit a, I think he was saying an angle. And so, the thing you have to be careful about is when you get pulled out wide, your opponents opened up a lot of court. And a lot of times we want to maybe get pulled out wide. Hopefully I'm still on camera. But if I get pulled way out wide and I create an angle here, now the thing you have to think about is, one, I have to recover. And so while I'm recovering, my opponent has some options of either going angle behind me or they can even go down the line. I usually don't create an angle when I get pulled off the court because it just opens up kind of a, a, a can of worms, Pandora's box of, what your opponent might do to you. Usually if I'm gonna create an angle, is because I'm inside the court and I'm able to manage it by not having to recover so much. So from this position, 
I would create an angle and make my opponent either go down the line or if they create an angle back, no big deal. I can probably cover both. But generally, when I'm pulled off the court, now I have to get back and then hit an angle behind me or go down the line. So generally, I like to create angles when I'm inside the court. I'm able to manage how much court I have to uh, cover when I recover uh, so I don't have to run too much and I'm not guessing too much. So there you go. I do think one exception to the rule. Oh, Megan. Would be, and Logan, you know me well enough to know I got an exception. One exception to the rule would be if um, you're, because you really only want to angle off of an angle okay. um, to have a very effective angle. And so if you have someone who's angling you off the court, but you're not far enough where you're far out inside, the, then angling back, even though you're close to the sideline or close to the alley, to get them off the court, to open up the court for you, is it a good option? Okay, so there you go. You got it from both Sorry, sides. Sorry, you didn't quite see me explain that <clears throat> Facebook, but yeah. You just hear it, Megan. Just is hear everywhere. me. It's my voice. The voice. I should have turned it around. No worries. Uh, any good Facebook questions? If not, um, if not I have helpful. a son that's new to tennis, wondering which serve should he learn first, slice or power? And can you give a demo? Okay, so new to tennis. Uh, the questions I would have when I say new to tennis is like, what does that mean? Does it mean like they just started, I'm assuming they just started playing, so I'll put it in a, a category. They just started playing. I really wouldn't worry about uh, power or slice. I would worry about getting the solid fundamentals of having a serve. So what I mean by fundamentals is um, seeing if they can start and keep a continental grip, really important. See if they can get into a position where they're not having the, the palm up. So I think that's really important. Third year third year of playing tennis. Okay, so if we're in third year of playing tennis, I'm still focusing, and third year can mean a lot, just to be honest, because I've had people play for three years and they play, let's say, five days a week, and it's like, whew, they played a lot of tennis. So I'm gonna generalize and say, pretty beginner, but they're, they're progressing. And same thing, having the fundamentals. If I'm, I'm not necessarily thinking about a type of serve, uh, first I'm thinking about the fundamentals of, can they hit a serve without, having the racket open up because that'll prevent you from hitting any type of target. When it comes to, let's say, the target or the type of serve, that's gonna come down to a couple things, which is the racket path on the way up and the racket face. And so if you've developed all those other things, uh, changing the racket path and the racket face is very minute. It might be a little bit different for the kick serve because most players, when they're, they're having trouble learning the kick serve and brushing up on the ball, that's a, a, a challenge at first, but generally, if I have every, all these other elements where I'm, good, I'm very balanced, I can take my racket up, I can pull my racket up on edge, and from this position, I can go flat. Well, that's more of a, not necessarily flat, uh, but I can go flat or slice. That's more of a slice, I miss both serves. But I can go any kind of serve I want and just change the racket uh, path and face at contact. So that's, that's where I would really start, even with a lot of juniors that I've worked with over the years, I want to have them to have strong fundamentals and making sure that they can do the action of getting the racket up on edge. Because if they can do that, then teaching them to go up on the ball, uh, like a kick serve or a slice serve, it's just a lot easier. So uh, hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, I think um, Tasha had another question about the forehand. Um, it says, having trouble using semi-Western or Western um, on the forehand because he doesn't feel like he has a clean ball. So I'm assuming he probably uses more of a, um, an Eastern grip right now. And how, how would you make it more comfortable to switch from that Eastern to semi-Western? I don't think we, none of us would recommend switching to Western, but yeah. um, switching to that semi-Western. So and you're going Eastern to semi-Western? Maybe the swing path. Um, I would say one thing about when you switch a grip, what you're really doing is repositioning your hand or the, what I call the stabilization in your hand. So if we look at this pad, I'll give Facebook some love. Look at this pad here, YouTube, look at this pad here. What we wanna do is position the pad behind the racket. So you've been positioning, the, let's say an Easter grip with the pad behind the racket. So your hand is used to resisting the force of the ball this way. As you switch to a different grip, what you're actually doing is switching that position. And so now that I switch that grip, Look what happens to my racket face. Well, I need my racket face like this. And so now from that little switch, your hand's slightly 
I don't want to say it's not under, but it's behind and slightly under. So the, the, the pressure is different and the path becomes different. Where before, with the grip going this way, yeah, you can still generate spin, but the pad is behind. And um, as you rotate up, you can keep that pad behind. When you switch to the semi-Western, that's what's happening. And that's what's kind of like maybe causing some disruption in that feeling of yours. What I would recommend is once you switch, go out with the, I'll just do it this way, go out and just drop feed yourself balls and get used to having that pad slightly in that different position and make sure as you're hitting, you're feeling that pad push up against the racket and resisting the ball until you get used to it. So let's say right now I'm switching, I'll switch my grip to an Eastern. Guess what? That doesn't feel as comfortable for me because my pad and my path is used to this different, uh, pa uh, I guess, path of uh, swing. So what you really have to do is just train it. It's something that you're your, your muscles, your hand is going, I don't recognize what you're doing to me. And that's probably causing a lot of disruption in, in what you're doing. And you just have to train it so it feels comfortable. Funny enough, I made a switch when I was a junior. I used to have a pretty Western grip. And then I had a coach that made me go really, really strong Eastern. And then it just disrupted my whole game. And then I slid over into something like a semi-Western. And it took quite a while just of practicing to get that feel so you don't have to think about it. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I think that that definitely does. I think Ryan is talking about he plays every shot in continental. Um, what should you work on doing a different grip? I think yeah. Ooh, Ryan. that's a, I think it's, uh, I'll turn around. Oh, nope. It won't let me. Well, if, uh, if you could see me, just pretend. I did, um, we're throwing some love. That, Megan's away. <laughs> oh, okay. boom. Hi. Hi, Ryan. Okay. So I think the biggest thing is, is that if you have continental, um, it can limit um, your spin. It can limit you. So if you can move over a little bit on your grip towards semi-Western, towards even Eastern, it would probably help you to have more variety in your forehand. Um, with continental, unless you're really flipping that wrist, it's really hard to be able to hit a good top spin ball. With semi-Western or even east, somewhere between Eastern and semi-Western, it's a lot easier to get a little bit more variation um, on the ball, which is going to help you to increase your level of play. Yeah, totally. Oh, switch Hi. back, Facebook. <laughs> it's the handoff. And just to add on to kind of what Megan was saying, if you think about a continental grip, think about shaking hands. So if I'm shaking hands, look how much play my wrist has. There's not that much. It's more uh, meant for like if the ball's super low, old school. Now, if I turn my hand in this position, look how much play my wrist has. So the difference of a continental here, not a lot of wrist play. If I switch over my grip, it naturally puts my hand into where I can rotate the wrist a little bit more doesn't mean just by rotating your wrist you're going to get topspin, but it gives you the option of rotating and add, adding more brush, being in a more comfortable situation with the hand. And that will give you more options and more ability and variety of what you can do with the ball. Mm -hmm. What do we got? Should can you uh, feed a couple for me? Oh, I'm feeding. <clears throat> Matthew's been really patient on uh, YouTube. He's been asking about how to improve drop shots. And oh, so the drop shot. Drop shot is really similar to the backhand slice that we, uh, we were talking about a little bit earlier. It's all about the angle of attack and the angle of the racket face, as, as well as how relaxed or tense your hand is. And I've asked Kevin to feed to me because I actually don't like practicing the drop shot off a, off a, uh, a self toss because there's no momentum on the ball. And I think a, a big key to improving at the drop shot is learning how to use the momentum that your opponent is giving you and redirect it softly. And that's all about finding the right tension with your hand and the right angle with your racket face. So um, what I'm gonna do here, Kevin's gonna feed me some, um, some relatively soft shots and I'm gonna start off relatively close to the net on purpose and we're gonna do some, some experiments here. Uh, so be to, to begin with, my goal is going to be to hit a shot that doubles the height of the net. So I'm looking for my shot to travel three feet over the top of the net and land right around the, right around the middle of the service box. Um, Kevin, can you put a cone uh, right in the middle of the service box, please? I got it. So we're gonna go through a couple of progressions here and you can do this at home with somebody tossing to you or with a ball machine or with a coach. But uh, bottom line for me is that I think it's important to have some speed or some momentum coming towards you. Uh, so can I have some forehands, please, Kevin? So 
My goal is to hit a shot basically just like that, three feet over the net and landing softly in the middle of the service box. And I'm achieving that by gently coming down to the ball. I'm not coming down steeply. I'm probably only dropping, uh, I don't know, what was it, about a foot or so uh, no. down to the ball, uh, give or take. So this isn't like a big downward chop. And a, a big key here, a successful drop shot is not about creating as much backspin as possible. I think the top mistake that I see amateur players make is they get a uh, drop shot uh, opportunity and they're trying to hit this like crazy shot that bounces back over the net. And it's completely unnecessary and raises the chance that you're gonna make a mistake dramatically. So what you're seeing me do here on these uh, practice ones is just find the right angle of my racket, find the right angle and amount of drop down to the ball so that I achieve the shot I'm looking for. I'm pretty happy with that. So I'm, now I'm gonna start to n narrow it down a little bit. So I'm gonna ask Kevin to take the cone and uh, bring it in by like three feet. Now I wouldn't try this target from back in no man's land, but from up here, I can, I can start to hit that. And so what I'm gonna do is experiment a bit with the angle of my racket face and experiment a little bit with how firm I am with the racket. I'm gonna be a little softer and I'm gonna close my face a little more so the ball's not gonna arc up as high, which means it's gonna fall a little bit shorter in the court. So now I'm looking across the net by like a foot or so, maybe 18 inches off the same feed. And that's exactly what I'm looking for uh, right there. Let me hit a couple more of those. And once I kind of get that uh, grooved in a little bit, I would create a little more distance between me and the ball. So now I'm a little bit behind the service line which makes that target significantly more difficult to hit. And again, I'm gonna kind of recalibrate the angle of my hand, the tension in my hand. And so I'm going to be giving a little bit more force into the ball. I'm gonna have a little bit more firmness with my hand. And I'm also gonna have a little bit more of an open racket face because I need more arc to clear the net and have it fall uh, that short by where the, uh, the cone is. Oh, sorry. Ooh. <laughs> I'm pretty happy with that. Just clearing the net, softly coming down. And now I'm gonna go back to no man's land. So this will be by far the toughest uh, target. Target's in the same spot. So I need to open my racket face a little bit more, maybe be a little bit firmer. That's about right. Not bad. Oh. There it is, perfect. <laughs> so the key here is experimentation. I, I'm making like a couple of degree angle change from rep to rep to try to find the right trajectory. And I'm making like a small, I, I wish I had a measurement. I don't know how many foot pounds or, or whatever pressure, uh, but small adjustments with the, uh, my grip pressure. And the combination of those two things gives me slightly different ball flights, slightly different depths of result. And just doing these calm experiments is the best way, in my opinion, for you to really feel what a good drop shot is like and be able to repeat it uh, reliably. That's something maybe to add to it. Yeah. Because I feel like they tie in the mindset of the drop shot. Because yeah. I think a lot of times- so, the There was other questions about uh, like, what, when should I be drop shotting? Like what's the point situation? Point situation, I, I'll tag onto that. But I think okay. the mindset of like, sometimes we see a drop shot and like, I mean, this target was a really good target. But the mindset a lot of times is that when we hit a drop shot, it's the end all be all. It's like my drop shot is gonna win the point. So what that sets up when you have that mindset is that I need to create this like stellar, unreal, kind of like what Ian was talking about. I'm gonna hit a drop shot that's gonna come back in the net. And I think that's totally false in the sense that a drop shot is a setup to finish the point, hopefully. If you're, if you, I, kinda, I have the saying that I wanna hit a bunch of good shots to win points, not great shots. Meaning that I wanna hit a bunch of forehands or backhands in this area, but if I do hit it close to the baseline, it's a great shot and yay, but I'm not gonna count on hitting the ball a foot away from the baseline. Same thing with the drop shot. If I do hit a drop shot winner, great, but I'm not going for it. And so what that sets up is that I'm not trying to hit a winner, which puts more pressure on hitting this insane drop shot. Because I hit a decent drop shot or a good drop shot, and I look to put my opponent in a bad position where they have to move up to the net, they're struggling and they're gonna pop the ball up, and then I finish the point, it makes my drop shot more effective and it puts less pressure on me. So like Ian was saying, kind of the next question was, uh, what's the situation that I would maybe use to hit a drop shot? Generally, um, I like to set drop shots up by, by creating a hole somewhere. 
So usually I'm pushing my opponent back in some uh, fashion and they leave the ball short. That leaves a hole in the, in the kind of in front of them. That's sometimes too obvious. I really like the mixing up. So a strategy I would use a lot of times if I get a short ball is to simply approach like normal. Okay, so I set up this condition, or I'm conditioning my opponent to think when I get a short ball, Kevin's gonna come through and blast the ball, come to net and put it away. Now, what I'll do is mix this up so the next time I get a short ball, instead of hitting a, a forehand, I hit a drop shot. Because in their mind, once they've been conditioned, they see me running to hit a, a forehand approach, they're backing up. They're naturally thinking, okay, I got a brace. And because they're backing up, they're creating a hole and also a kind of disguised it and conditioned the situation to be more my favor. So those are situations that I like to hit a drop shot. Um, usually sometimes I think it might be a little obvious. Like if let's say they're way off the court and you know I'm running like this, a lot of times your opponent sees it coming, they're gonna start dashing. I like disguising the drop shot. Another quick one is that I'll hit backhand slices and then I'll go to a drop shot. So I just won't go willy nilly into a drop shot. I feel like we got some questions, so I'm gonna cut that one short. I have one on grip. Is that cool? Sure. Go ahead. Um, want to know about? Can you say this is a quick one? But how far down on the grip do you hold your racket? She um, sometimes has the pinky off the handle, um, and maybe what that causes to have the pinky off the handle. I normally don't hold it. I mean, this is for normal like ground stroke serve. Yeah, I think. Okay. It's just normally, I don't have my pinky off. Um, actually, I went for a while where it was close to being off. A lot of times I think what players are trying to get when they get the pinky off is they're just trying to relax. And I think when you do have your pinky off, you feel a lot more play, a lot more uh, looseness in the racket where sometimes players find that they squeeze the racket with the pinky on and it's a little stiffer. So I think mainly I wouldn't do it. Uh, I feel like Megan has some, do, no? No, I mean, that's, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would, I always say that it's going to be towards the bottom. Sorry. I'm giving you some love. Love time. <laughs> love time. Megan, everybody. Megan. Um, I feel like you want to have it to where um, any – I think there's a little bit of play that can be um, whatever is your, yeah. your personal preference. Um, I would say it doesn't need to be any higher than where the bottom of your hand is meeting the bottom of the butt cap. And it doesn't – you don't want it to be any lower than the butt cap um, a little bit – south of the middle of the palm um so depending upon what you like the most i think is the biggest thing but i would say pinky off is is very difficult it can, yeah. it can cause some issues but um i also say this actually causes issues too which i see a lot too so i think it's uh finding that personal preference i and keep mine right here yeah no so and i would also kind of agree that you want to hold the rack in a position that's optimal for giving you the most reach um very few players uh, hold the racket up here. I can only think of really, and uh, there might be more, don't get me wrong, but one player that h held the racket really far up, and that's if, if you know, if Guinea Kafelnikov held this racket really high. But I mean, he was like six foot three, big guy, but I don't see a lot of other players holding the racket up that far. Um, so generally you have players with the racket here, um, maybe a little mm -hmm. higher, but they don't want to, once you start gripping up here, you start losing reach. and. In today's game, you don't want to lose reach. Uh, somebody on YouTube uh, just quickly said, but your pinky can be off though, right? So where, where, where do you guys fall on that? I'm personally not a pinky off type of guy. I like I'm the pinky either. on. I'm I think oh, you, you're going to lose a little bit of stability when you're reaching. And uh, that would just, I don't know, that feels really annoying. I don't know. But I'm not a pinky off type of guy. I mean, No, I, I have done a progression with the bottom two hands oh. off though when you're working on the looseness. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. have done that progression before, yeah. but to actually hit all of your balls with your pinky off, I think it gives a little too much. You, you're using your wrist probably a little bit too much instead of actually using your arm. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Do you have a question? Yeah, I do have one. Question. And I, I lost it. I'm trying to find Oh, here it is. Here it is. OK. Uh, Real quick, because this is kind of a pet peeve of mine. Oh, uh, Effie, I believe, said, open stance or neutral stance for ultimate forehand. What's the ultimate <laughs> uh, stance? Oh, Ian's going to go ultimate answer <laughs> on this uh, ultimate, ultimate forehand. Answer. So um, uh, Effie, it's, it's not about uh, which is inherently better. It's about matching the stance to the situation. 
Uh, Kevin, would you mind uh, hitting? Sorry. I was going to say, amen. I was okay. preaching to the choir. I'm going to toss a couple balls to you. Okay. So um, first of all, can we define this real quick, Ke uh, Kevin, on the baseline, please? Uh, can you show everybody what an open stance uh, forehand looks like, Kevin? So open, open means that his feet are aligned lateral to the baseline. So it's an, an open stance. His, his stance is open to the net. Uh, a neutral stance is square. And so now the alignment of his feet is 90 degrees to the baseline. That's a neutral stance. And a closed stance is closed off to the baseline. And so uh, this question asker was, was saying, well, which is best, neutral, neutral stance or open stance? Uh, and I, I think there's a, an attitude among a lot of teaching, a lot of teachers in tennis uh, that they're either really, really holding on to the way things used to be, and they have the attitude that just step into the ball. Like, uh, no matter what the situation, you, you got to get behind the ball, uh, load up, and step in, which in reality is completely unrealistic. And then you've got a lot of like kind of new school um, uh, people preaching like uh, open stance who have the same kind of attitude about open stance. Like, no, no matter what, you've got to load up on your outside foot. And uh, both are in error, in my opinion, because there are different situations that lend themselves better to each stance. So for example, uh, if Kevin was getting really pulled out wide uh, towards the doubles alley, uh, neutral stance would just not be realistic. You wanna try hitting neutral stance? Uh, I, I saw <laughs> this coming, go ahead. So I'm gonna toss, I'm gonna purposely toss out a little further than really what we should ever expect Kevin to be able to get to, plant his right foot, and step into the ball with a, with a neutral stance. Oh, he got there. He got there. He got there. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to have to challenge him a little bit more. I'm fast. <laughs> that was like a that was jump good, step. Good effort. Good effort. Okay. So right at the last second, he threw his left foot over there. And it, it, was, it was good effort. I like it. Um, clearly, that's not a natural way of moving. That, that's what open stance is really tailor-made for, is, is um, getting to a ball loading your upper body, but without having to close your hips around, uh, which allows you to um, hit very dynamically and recover very easily back towards the middle. So um, go ahead and you, you use the uh, open stance. Nice, nice demonstration. Uh, so open stance now. So you'll see him load on his right foot. And it's very easy for him to rotate back around without having to step forwards and then get back to open to recover back in a neutral uh, position again. So anything really wide, open stance is just, it, you just really can't do any better. Now on the other hand, if he was uh, receiving a ball that was relatively short um, and he's in a balanced, strong position, uh, you could still use open stance, but that's really what neutral or square stance is tailor made for. Uh, for a ball that's just right in front and you have the opportunity to, to transfer forwards and use your body with a, a, a more closed stance to rotate and then open back up again. And again, just to be clear, he could use open stance here. Go, go ahead, use open stance on that ball, Kevin. Same ball. You can tell he's, he's, he's more comfortable with square stance. And it really, this kind of varies a little bit from player to player. But without the ability to do both, uh, go ahead and show us uh, square one more time, Kevin. Neutral. Without the ability to do both, you'll have some kind of hole in your baseline game where you're just not a very uh, efficient mover and you'll leave yourself vulnerable to different types of opponents. So it's not about which is better, it's about being able to do both to match the situation during points. That's all I got. Sweet. Nice I, um, I love the forced I, uh, <laughs> close stance. Get it in there. Um, to kind of <laughs> go a little bit into, there's like another footwork question I had that sure. we might want to um, do. Um, maybe you could Facebook for a second. Oh yeah, sure. Um, I think, uh, Mark wants to know like the progression, like how, what kind of footwork you would use on certain balls. You want a demo? Sure. Um, and I think one of the biggest things, probably the biggest misconception that people is going backwards, um, learning to actually drop step and cross to be able to go backwards is huge. Um, a lot of players try to run back like this as the ball is coming and that makes it very difficult plus you're going to fall on your butt half the time so the biggest thing is making sure that your first step split step and then drop step when you load is huge so if i'm moving backwards to the ball and you don't have to take a huge like a ton of steps um if I'm gonna, uh, 
So get okay. you behind. <laughs> if I'm going to move you back, so he's going to go drop step, step, and then hit. I'm watching. I won't move you that far. So it's only a couple steps, but the drop step, step crossover, and then hitting off the back foot is huge for a ball that's back there. And you might be taking it a little bit on the rise, which is good too. Um, if you're doing like the shuffle step that we just went over, so it's just one shuffle step in, um, stepping into the ball. So he was going shuffle step forward off the front foot. That's another one. And then the out wide, okay. like we worked on. Thanks. The out wide to where your first step is always going to be outside foot. And then he's going to go open stance, outside foot, and back. Okay. So I think the biggest progression is going, making sure that your first step is always the outside foot and when you load. And then when you come back, is making sure that your first step is a crossover step to come back and recover. Yeah. Awesome. Bueno. Megan, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we're gonna I think we're gonna wrap up, guys. We're we're out of time. Um, yeah, we're just gonna wrap it up there. Um, everybody, thank you so much. Uh, those of you who've been watching on Facebook, appreciate your time and your attention. Those of you who've been watching on YouTube, thanks for bearing with us while we had some technical issues. Uh, let us know what you think in the comments, especially if you're watching the replay. Uh, did you like this format? It's significant amount of work for us to uh to set <laughs> you this can't up see look at all of the yeah, yeah there's, there's a lot of stuff going room. on behind the scenes that those of you on youtube uh, can't see that uh but it, it, it's a big uh, time commitment for us so if you want to see more of this uh give the video a like let us know in the comments down below um was this helpful did you like the format and uh, if so we'll, we'll definitely come back and do more uh any final thoughts Kevin no, I Megan? thought this was awesome. I thought that we had some awesome questions. Uh, we love the interaction. I personally love kind of the run and gun, just throw whatever you, you got at me and like <laughs> yeah. just bring it, just bring it. So I love the format uh, of just answering tons and tons of questions. Agreed. It's kind of fun on the court. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Facebook.